Welcome to all of you, and also welcome to all of you online. And uh, today we're going to talk about taking refuge. I think because there has been this long period of uh, the whole world is shut down, <laughs> all of UK has been shut down, and uh, no travels, no ceremonies for two years. So Lama Yeshe Rinpoche has not been here for two years, two and a half years, three years. Uh, I think the, the last refuge ceremony must have been three years ago. So there's a, uh, a lot of people who've asked us about refuge. And I think there are quite a lot of people online now, today. So I hope that what we're doing today will be beneficial for you so that by the time the refuge ceremony comes, then you will be ready and you will know what it entails, what it means and, and uh, what to do. But So we'll start first with uh, the prayers. <coughs> I think you have them in front of you. Oi palden sabe la mar en poche da que che vo pende de chola caden tempo con e desonde cosun do jen a drop sa do so sande che dang so je chonam la Shangjo padu dane chab su je Tage jin su je pe su nam je Trola pen je sanje du pa cho Sanje cho dang su je cho nam la Shangjo padu dane chab su je Tage jin so ji pe su nam ji Tro la pen ji san ji du pa shu San ji chu dang su ji chu nam la San ji pa du ta ni chap su ji Tage jin so ji pe su nam ji Tro la pen jie san jie tru pa shu Sem jie tham jie de wa dang Te ve ju dang den pa ju jie Dung a dang Dung a jie ju dang dal wa ju jie Dung a me pe de wa dam pa dang min dal wa ju jik Ye ring cha dan dan dal we ton yom chen po la ne pa ju jik Sem jen tham je de wa dang de we ju dan den pa ju jik Dung a dan dung a ji ju dan dal wa ju ji Dung a me pe de wa dam pa dang min dal wa ju ji Nye reng cha dan dan dal ve ton yom chen po la ne pa ju ji Sem jen tham jie de wa dang de ve ju dang ju jik Dung a dang dung a ji ju dang dal wa ju jik Dung a me pe de wa dang pa dang min dal wa ju jik Nye ring cha dan dan dal ve ton yom chen po la ne pa ju chen Oye ning to chen pa pa ye len ma dru Lo dru chen pa cha gun de ni sik Dru pa chen pa chom dru ji an tun Lo sa chen pa shab la sol van dip Nu tu chen pa kun da se ne che Ka je chen pa la ma nye pa se 
sundu chambu du pe ja sen so re pa chambu shabla solvan de tek pa chambu re cho yon su se sa ja chambu to pa ngun du ju ten le chambu kha da nyam pa da Nigam chambu shabla solvande tampa namla gube sotabdu dubju ten sen chonam shabden ching tempa ren chen chuju je padang je ten gele chambu chapai so je wa kuntu yam da lama dang tame long chu ching sa dang lam je yan ten ra so ne to je chang ge go phang nyo to so So um So the plan is that I will explain to you what it means to take refuge the meaning of refuge uh to some degree because you have to also discover yourself what does it mean to take refuge because it's not just about a ceremony it's about finding refuge it's about recognizing that we need a refuge So it's not just about what I say to you it's not about words it's about recognizing the need for refuge and and about recognizing what can provide a refuge what gives a refuge where can we look for refuge what can truly provide me with refuge from suffering obviously we're talking about refuge from suffering and um yeah so we'll look at that today <coughs> we will have a break just to explain to you we will have a break because we're saying that half past 3 we will light the lights in the courtyard for world peace for world for universal peace for peace everywhere and uh, we do that every saturday at 3:30 at least so far so we'll do that and then you'll have a break after that So from 3:30 and until quarter past 4 there will be a break and I'm telling that also for the people online you can all light a, a light at home you can light a candle at home uh so and then we come back and we do a final session so but anyway what we'll look at is this the meaning of refuge and uh refuge in general we look for refuge all the time when i first came to samuel ling a long time ago i uh, there was a sort of a standard question that it, everybody was asked when you were a new person coming to the center all the other people who might have been there for a month or for even just a few weeks or whatever all the other visitors they would ask each other the same questions so say Oh, how long are you have you been here? How long are you going to be here? And have you taken refuge? <laughs> It was like standard. Everybody said, "Have you taken refuge?" Said, "Have you taken refuge?" I had never heard about taking refuge when I first came to Samling. I really had never heard about it because you did not read about it in the books. Now even now there's not so many actual explanations about taking refuge. I said, "What does it mean? Do you have to take <laughs> refuge? <laughs> Something you have to do? I'm not sure. I want to tie myself down to any sort of following any sort of institution any sort of becoming a part of something else i don't want to be a part of anything i want to be free from things i don't want to tie myself up to one thing because then you are separate from everyone else i didn't know what it means to take refuge so slowly i found out i stayed up there in uh, for about 6 months and during that period of time i i discovered more what does it mean and then by so i came in august by december that was 
His Holiness, the 16th Kamatwa, came to Sami Leng. So by then I understood what does it mean to take refuge, and I was ready. I was kind of eager, I couldn't wait. I said, well, how, when is he coming? When, why is nothing happening? Why is he like, <laughs> you know, because at that time there was really nothing happening in Sami Leng because the 16th Kamapa was traveling in Europe for all that time. I came to Sami Leng in a very quiet period when His Holiness was traveling in Europe and Akron Rinpoche was organizing and was in charge of the tour. So he was not there. Everybody was traveling with His Holiness. There was a very few people in Sami Leng and uh, no program really. So I was just up there helping, volunteering, doing this and asking the few poor volunteers who were there saying, what, what's happening, you know? Why is nothing happening? When, when is it going to happen? So in December, His Holiness, the 16th Kamapa came and there was a, there were several, there was two refuge ceremonies actually. That's when I took refuge. So it took me, just telling you, it took me like this, six months in Sami Ling to really feel ready. I want to take refuge. I know I want to take refuge. And before that, of course, I had read about books about meditation for quite a while and and I just knew when I came to Samiling, I wanted to meditate. I wanted to meditate to work on my own mind. That's the one thing I was clear about. Pretty much that was about all I was clear about. I wanted to work on my own mind because I knew I needed to develop some inner stability and clarity of mind. I was 25 years at that time. And uh, so I, I feel like if you're not sure, I feel I understand. If you're not sure, if you don't really know, I feel I understand this. My initial response to the idea of taking refuge was very much that it's like becoming part of the in crowd. You know, <laughs> is that a wrong way of saying it? <laughs> you know, that wrong, it was a wrong interpretation on my part, but it can look like that. It looks like, oh, you're becoming part of the insiders and, and everybody else who are not Buddhists, they are the, they are the outsiders. It's absolutely not like that because for one thing, there's no one who keeps a track of how many people, how many people take refuge, how many Buddhists there are in the world. Now they have started doing, doing census in this country, so we start to know a little bit how many Buddhists there are, but there's no one who sort of keeps a tab of, there's no one who tries to convert you, there's no one who tries to bring you into the fold, so to speak. <coughs> um, and of course, the whole Buddhist view is not about becoming part of something else, because that's a very dualistic view, isn't it? And uh, Buddhism is about going beyond separation. It's about going beyond all forms of duality. So it's about going beyond this and that. Even on the ultimate level, it's about going beyond good and bad. But on a relative level, of course, we have to very much apply ourselves according to the principles of good and bad and karma cause and effect. But uh, so, so just to explain to you this idea, we have to, this, this, my own response to this was because I did not understand that I had all along, throughout my whole life, I have been taking refuge already. So what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> I had already been taking refuge since I was a child, taking refuge in my mother, in my father, in my family, in my friends, in any form of material security I could find. And growing up as a teenager, you take refuge in whatever you take refuge in. Your friends, your partners, your husbands, wives, lovers, uh, uh, friends, uh, material security, education, knowledge, wealth, prestige, whatever society can provide us with, we look to that for refuge, right? That is what we are doing. We are looking for some sort of protection and security when we look to those things. And I have to say that taking refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha does not mean that we should give up 
getting a good education or having a good job or looking for financial security. No, of course, these things are important on a simple, uh, basic, relative level that you have a reasonable good life. But we recognize by the time you come to taking, uh, looking for spiritual refuge, you recognize that those things cannot, they are not capable of providing you with a refuge. And that's the difference. We, but we see that, yes, I looked for refuge in my relationship. I looked for refuge in my friendships. I looked for refuge in the material wealth and all these areas, but did it provide me with that refuge? Did it provide me with some sort of security and stability and freedom from suffering? No. That's a conclusion we have to come to by then. Come to that conclusion. No, it could not provide. It was not capable. Not that there was really necessarily anything wrong with those things. You, we might have a good friend, we might have good partners, we might have good jobs, but impermanence. Everything is unstable. I mean, we don't have to even, we don't have to argue about that, that's for sure. <laughs> we don't even have to debate about it. We don't even have to think twice about whether things are unstable and insecure all around us. This is particularly at the moment, it is so clear. We've just had two years of COVID, all the turmoil that has happened worldwide during these last two years have shown us that all these things, they could not provide us with the security. Sickness and health, we cannot also uh, look for refuge in good health. We might try as much as we can to stay healthy, and that's a good thing. Look after your body, look after your health, yes. But can we secure a good health? No, we cannot. <clears throat> Can we secure material security? No, we cannot, because the whole world economy has just had a big wobble <laughs> you know, for two years. Those with a secure job lost their job, others do, 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 do. All this is like a juggle. It's been a juggle for so many people, keeping things going. Some people are good at juggling, some people are not good at juggling. Then now we have other sort of insecurities on a political landscape. How do we know? How do we know there will be uh, stability? Look, and I mean, it's so straightforward, isn't it? We look at Ukraine and see what's happening there. How do we know that it's not going to happen here? Look at next year, look in six months, look in five years from now. Where are we going to be in five years from now? We just don't know. There is total insecurity in our life, and that is the nature of samsara. So, if we think, oh, but that's just like a little blip we're going through, that's just like a little sort of wobble that the world is going through, and five, ten years from now it'll all have settled out, and the balance is back, and we'll be on track again. It's just no guarantee. So the Buddha, this is what the Buddha taught, said everything is impermanent. Everything around us, external, is unreliable. If we want to find happiness, because that's what we want when we're looking for a refuge, we're looking for something to provide us with stable happiness and contentment. We're not talking about sort of partying all day or night or that sort of happiness. We're talking about genuine contentment and happiness in our life, where we feel this is really worthwhile, this is really valuable, this really has meaning, it is meaningful and precious. Something that I would not regret uh, later on. Something that I feel, if I spend my life on this, it has been very well spent, like investing my life. It's like if you get a good education, you feel, yes, I did not waste my time by getting a good education because it does give me some uh, degree of uh, uh, path forward in a relative level. 
But so that's externally. But when we talk about internally and inner happiness and stability, where we can cope with all these ups and downs in life, where we can cope with the insecurity, where we can cope with the losses and gains and the changes that happen in, wo in the world that are out of our control. Because that's a point, isn't it, that so many of these things are not in our control. If they were within our control, yeah, maybe then we can say, okay, I can just sit here and steer the boat, steer the vessel, and I can navigate all the different rocks that stick out of the water and all the uh, all these different sort of islands that pro crop up and and I won't uh, go into the what do, what is that big ship that went down that famous ship Titanic, Titanic they, not real I won't become a Titanic because I can steer like that but we can't do that you know it's just not possible because it's not in our control. Everything is unpredictable. There's no, there's no map. There's no map for us to say, okay, here, go left, go right. There's no compass for us to use. So because it's out of our control, we, can, we, we cannot rely on external things. And what we start to recognize in this looking for a Another form of refuge is that if we want to develop inner happiness and if we want to develop stable contentment and happiness in that sense, we need to look inwards. We need to develop that sense of inner stability. Because our, all the refuge that we have been looking for up until now has been unstable, it has been external and has been unstable. So the difference now in looking for refuge is that recognition and that understanding of actually refuge is not new to me. I have been a refugee my whole life. <laughs> I have been a refugee in samsara. On the ocean of samsara I've been on my own little lonely raft trying to find somewhere to land securely. And then, when you come across the teachings of the Buddha, it's like you find a secure landing. That You've been on that raft of the ups and downs and the storms and the hills, and sometimes you've also had good, smooth times where there has not been very you know, rough seas. May have been a mixture of everything you know, good and bad together. But we come to that point where we see, okay, there is land, there is a place where I can actually take, you know, put down anchor and uh, find shelter. So find refuge, spiritual refuge. So the meaning of spiritual refuge is that coming across the teachings of the Buddha Dharma Sangha. I'm not saying that Buddhism is the only form of refuge. I think all the great spiritual traditions have something to offer. We need all the great spiritual traditions in the world. We are all different and we all have different needs. Uh, but for some and, and for some of us, Buddhism is what we connect with. For others, they connect with Christianity, others connect with Hinduism or with uh, Muslim faith or with uh, whatever different great faiths that all have compassion and loving kindness at its core. So, but at some point we start to recognize that these uh, external things cannot provide us with a refuge and, and the teachings can. So why can they? Why are they different? Why is it that Buddhism can provide us with a refuge that we were not able to find before? So it's because the Buddha, the Buddha taught about all these things. The Buddha taught about the world. The Buddha taught about suffering. The first teachings of the Buddha was the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering. If you know the life story of the Buddha, then you will remember that when the Buddha was 
still not the Buddha, but he was Prince Siddhartha when he was a young man. And he was living in the palace in this wonderful, perfect, supposedly perfect environment that couldn't be better. And his father was trying to protect him within that environment, shield him from any kind of suffering because he wanted him to become the next king. He didn't want him to, to renounce his kingdom and become a spiritual person. So then the, the Buddha became curious, you know, and he started to go out and leave together with his, his attendants. As one, one day he managed to sneak out the palace doors or the gates of the palace. So all the grounds, these beautiful grounds of the gardens that was like perfect flowers and fruits and birds and everything was perfect. It says within that environment, even before a flower showed signs of decay, it was plucked away and, you know, perfectly manicured. So that it was always perfect. Perfect smell, perfect sight, perfect sounds, perfect enjoyment. And then, of course, that was unsustainable because outside the palace gates it was not like that and the Buddha or Prince Siddhartha managed to sneak out and have a look, have a peek. And it says four times he went out through these different four gates, whether it was precisely like that, of course we don't know for sure. He went through the southern gate, through the eastern gate, through the northern gate, through the western gates. And each time he saw different things, so he thought, so, so we are saying really, uh, birth, old age, sickness and death. Now, birth had already happened, so he saw sickness, he saw old age, he saw death. Each time, so one time he saw sickness, he saw a sick person, he saw an old person, decrepit with age, he saw a funeral procession. And then a the fourth time, he saw a holy man spiritual person, maybe someone smeared in ashes or long hair and sitting in some form of uh, yogic uh, practices which were happening at that time. And each time he questioned his attendant and said, what has happened? What is going on? Never seen an old person before, never seen a sick person before, never seen all these people crying at a funeral before. And each time his attendant told him, Prince, this is what happens. Everyone who is born is going to get old, is going to get sick, is going to die. It's inevitable. It's the way life works. Don't know if he was allowed to tell the prince that, but the, he found out. And this is, is said to be how the prince, for the very first time, he started. He went back and he was so shaken because he saw suffering. He experienced suffering. He saw all these people going through hard times. And it shook him deep inside. And he went back to the palace, palace grounds and it says he sat under a tree that was is called an applewood tree that then became a very auspicious tree. Auspicious substances because it was a, the first time the Buddha actually sat down and contemplated and meditated. And it was like the seeds were planted for his spiritual awakening. And then he left the grounds eventually, and then he went on his path, and he reached enlightenment, and all the rest is, is history. <laughs> and he, so his first teaching was very, very important because it taught about the noble truth of suffering. And it taught about the causes of suffering. And then it also taught about how to free oneself from suffering. So once we have to know, we have to understand what causes suffering. We have to understand what is it that causes our own unhappiness. What is it that disturbs my mind? What is a genuine cause of suffering? Not externally, but in terms of my experiences. And then he taught uh, how to free oneself from suffering. And that it is possible to free oneself from suffering. It is possible to attain this inner happiness and stability, contentment and freedom. 
So these four noble truths were the first turning of the wheel of Dharma. And uh, uh, of course, at the time of the Buddha, there was no Buddhism, ism, there was no Buddhism, there was not even followers initially. There was no refuge ceremony as such. Uh, but gradually, uh, students started to gather around the Buddha and took robes and became monks and became nuns and lay people came. All, all types of followers, it says the four pillars, the male and female monastics, male and female lay followers. And so, uh, eventually, Buddhism, you know, was established and uh, grew over this period, of, uh, during the Buddha's life. So, uh, so when we ourselves come to this step, we say taking refuge is the threshold is a threshold of entering the p spiritual path because um, we have to have some element of trust when we start even to take that refuge we have to have some element of trust some element of faith is there you could say that threshold is faith we have understood enough about the Buddhist teachings to have that faith to enter that threshold, to walk through that threshold. And, um, and, and, and that's it, it's like having enough trust so that we can embark upon the path. We might feel that I've already entered the path, but when you take refuge there's still some element of commitment or certainty in your mind. It's that certainty we need, because that will benefit you in terms of your involvement on the path. When we, we could say, well, what's the difference if I take refuge, if I don't take refuge? But in your own mind, there is a certainty that develops and grows out of that first step of having trust and faith. And then the application that comes along with that and planting a seed that then grows through your own application and that where you are, you know, through your own application you gain more and more certainty and your faith grows. So it is a very organic path, you could say, the Buddhist path. It is not about blind faith. It is not about uh, just following. It's about having trust enough to embark on the path and then to continue your path of study, contemplation and reflection and meditation. So you are engaging in reflecting on the path, like the Buddha said, observe for yourself what it means, what, what I'm saying, observe for yourself if it is true or not. Uh, so it is not that you have to have complete faith in everything. And also you could say because the Buddhist, because taking refuge is a first step, usually when we take refuge we are not really sure about everything in Buddhism. How could we be? Because there's said to be 84,000 different types of teachings. Such a vast path. We don't understand everything. We don't understand what it means, like how can we truly have faith in reincarnation or karma or how it works and how, uh, you know, all the different levels of teachings and enlightenment and Buddha nature and all of that, because we haven't really studied it enough to, re to understand it yet. And that's not necessary. Uh, if, if for my own, I can speak from my own experience, I felt very much when I took refuge that I did not understand all those uh, deeper issues, topics. And I just felt I had, I had definite faith in, in those aspects of the Buddhist teachings that I understood <coughs> about my mind and about meditation and developing inner peace and seeing how the causes of suffering 
within my own mind and belief and faith in the practice of uh, meditation and the teachings to pacify suffering. And so I felt that those other deeper topics, they, I will put them on the shelf for now when I, will, I have enough faith and belief that I think this will come later. This will be something that will be understood and resolved later on my path. And that is fine, that is absolutely n normal to enter refuge with that attitude. You should not think that you have to know and understand all the Buddhist teachings in order to, take, to be ready to take refuge. I know that Akon Rinpoche, he said to people, you just have to have enough faith uh, that you have to have a, a sort of a trust in the Buddhist teachings and uh, belief in the Buddhist teachings and a wish to work on your own mind, to become a better human being, so that you can be a benefit to others. Sort of in a nutshell, that's what you're doing, putting it very simply. You have to be sure that you want to follow the Buddhist, Buddha's path to work on yourself, to work on your own mind, so you become better human beings. But it's not like a, it's not like a what do you call it, um, um, a fleeting. Taking refuge is not like a, f a, a passing sort of interest. You should not have that attitude to Buddhism. If it's something like a, a passing or temporary interest that you have, then it's not better that you don't take refuge. Then wait. If you feel that you're not really sure, or if you think you are, maybe you're a Christian. If you feel that you believe in God, God is a creator, then maybe you should not take refuge. Maybe you should wait until that's more clear for you. You can still use the aspects of the Buddhist teachings that seem right for you. But to actually become a Buddhist, it may not be right for you. If you already have an active religious path in another faith, because it could confuse you. It might, you might start to feel that you have one foot in one thing and one in another, and, and the gap between becomes wider and wider, and then you don't know which side to go to. <laughs> so you don't want to be in that position. But if you feel sure about the Buddhist path being what you want to follow and that that is something that's very, very important to you for the rest of your life, and then you're ready to take refuge. Um, I think His Holiness Dalai Lama often says also, you know, if you are a Christian, if you belong to another faith, there's no need to take refuge. Uh, yes, so, so that's one thing. But I think many of us in the West uh, who come to Buddhism, we, we have not, like we have left Christianity, or, or maybe just did not engage with Christianity, I don't know, or other religions. Mm. So, in terms of this refuge, uh, I want to tell you, there's different things I want to tell you, like with, with uh, we have like a, uh, 15 minutes before the light offering, so, mm, so what you normally, what you normally come, uh, what you normally st study as part of the Buddhist teachings and and not only study, what I would say is what you have experienced, what many people, I think, who are not born into Buddhism, many people who meet Buddhism later in their life, they come to Buddhism because they have directly experienced the uh, the truth of these four foundations, four thoughts. Four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. And we come to Buddhism because we have 
uh, we have seen those four thoughts to some extent, maybe not like very, very clearly. We haven't defined it so clearly in our own minds by the time we turn up uh, and, and, and come across the Buddhist teachings, but they are very clearly defined in the Tibetan Buddhist teachings, these four thoughts that turn the mind to Dharma, and we study them and come across them again and again, and these four thoughts are something that we need to keep alive and, and keep thinking about, contemplate throughout our spiritual path. It's not just for a beginner, but it's these thoughts of the precious human birth, impermanence, karma cause and effect, and the suffering of samsara, the inherent dissatisfactory nature of existence. So these four thoughts, I think often many of us, when we are not, because if you're born into Buddhism, it's a little bit different, isn't it? It's just like if we in the West were born into a Christian uh, family or Christian way of life or whatever, we don't necessarily absorb it, absorb it, or fully live it. But when you come to a spiritual path later in your life as a grown-up, then there's a, a very real connection. So many people, when they come to Buddhism, I believe, have already recognized certainly impermanence by seeing it directly around you, in your own life, in your family, in your friendships, in your relationships, in all these ways that I was just saying, like throughout COVID and, and the ways that we can so easily observe it in life. We look at the news, we hear about it, but we are directly affected, or our friends are suffering directly due to impermanence, or death and dying, all of that. It is so in our face. And that is the best way, I think, to come to the teachings, because it, it is not intellectual. It is very personally heartfelt. We understand, or you have experienced impermanence. Maybe you have experienced uh, the truth of suffering in terms of health and uh, all the different ways that suffering uh, is experienced. But we say precious human birth. So what it means is that one thing we may not have really waken up to is the fact of how many opportunities we have. So we say the first thing is precious human birth. How fortunate we are, all of us, in so many ways, and how we don't want to waste the opportunity of our life. So it comes in that order. <laughs> Precious human birth, impermanence, cause and effect, suffering of samsara. So this fact that I have this, my life here, and what am I gonna do with it? Up until now, we may have been riding on a wave and just gone along with the way circumstances took us, but there's a certain point where we start to say, okay, yeah, this something makes real sense to me. That's how I felt when I read about Buddhism, I thought, this makes sense, this makes so much sense. I really can feel, uh, can connect with this way of thinking. And I must do something with my life. It's called like the uh, Daljo Rinchen, the precious, Daljo Rinchen Milieu, the precious human life, where we have actually a lot of opportunity in our life and we don't want to waste it. So it's also like, say, what the Buddha, experience my life. I don't want to waste it. I want to do something about uh, with my life. I want to do something meaningful with my life. Not just engage in the continuous, just sort of material pursuits or going to, uh, you know, chasing all the external things that are so unstable. But so along with that is recognizing that our human life is impermanent. The, uh, the lives of all beings is impermanent. Everything is impermanent. And so we see that we cannot take our life for granted either. We cannot take for granted that we will have a long, a good old age even, you know. Death comes to young people sometimes before old people. 
uh, sickness can come at any time, death can come at any time, everything is impermanent. So there's that recognition as well of impermanence in all things. So our life is impermanent, everything is around us is impermanent, and we want to make then good use of it. So cause and effect is recognizing, well, what can I do with this? I have this moment right now, here now, what can I do? What is, uh, you know, what is the best thing to do? So looking at cause and effect is we start to see there is positive things we can do. There's negative things we can give up. And we start to understand this whole idea of consequences of our actions, body, speech and mind. Our responsibility of body, speech and mind. And the Buddha went into great depth of, uh, in his teachings, noble eightfold path of describing, you know, karma, cause and effect, and what is right view, right concentration, right mindfulness, right livelihood, right meditation, all these ways of living our life that is very meaningful and helpful and positive. And then the fourth of these thoughts is the suffering of samsara. And of course what we look at in karma as well, in terms of consequences, is our mind state, in terms of our negative emotions effects of anger, effects of desire, effects of selfishness, effects of ignorance. So, um, then the Buddha, yes, the fourth of these th uh, thoughts is the suffering of samsara, dukkha, this suffering, the truth of suffering. And um, where this, when we talk about dissatisfactoriness or dukkha or this noble truth of suffering or this force of these thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. In Sanskrit, dukkha means many, many things. Like it means this whole range of dissatisfaction. It does not only mean intense suffering. It means any level of uh, distress, dissatisfaction, unhappiness, sadness, like in, it means incapable of satisfying. It's a recognition that anything that is unstable, unreliable, uh, totally up and down, is incapable of bringing contentment and satisfaction. And that there's always some element of suffering within that state. There's always some element of insecurity. There's some element of fear, of worry, of striving and uh, unhappiness. So um, these four thoughts, when we have sort of come to a degree of recognition of these, that um, this fact that we are oh, we're always looking for something, but we cannot always find what we're looking for, there's four, it talks about four types of, of sufferings. The fact of not finding what we're looking for. The fact of sometimes we find it, but we cannot keep it. So the third is like, then we found it, but we are separated. We, uh, like the previous one is like, we're afraid of losing what we have. The third one is like, we are being separated from what we, what, what's dear to us. And the fourth one is, we get what we don't want. There's all these different conditions that are out of our control due to impermanence. So not finding what we seek, we're never content, we're always looking for more, we're always dissatisfied. Not keeping what we have, whereas we're afraid of losing our job, our things, our positions, our wealth, our health and in separation from what is dear, from families, friends, partners, due to circumstances, decline in wealth, power, reputation. Fourth, getting what we don't want, such as sickness, enemies, lawsuits, it could be anything. These are, this is part of life, right? So that's this continuous dissatisfaction of worldly 
conditions that are out of our control. That's all these islands that are in the, we are on our raft and these islands that pop up that we can't really control and that we, we, we're looking for a refuge from all of these. So then that's when we come to that point of we're looking for a different kind of refuge. We're looking for a spiritual refuge. We recognize we cannot take a refuge in all these external objects. So we start to look for the internal objects, even though to some extent they're also external to some degree. The three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So looking for these, or going for refuge in these three objects, three jewels that can provide a refuge. What I would say is ultimately what we take refuge in is in our own mind. Because ultimately, as the Buddha lived 2,500 years, he's not here. Uh, the Dharma is the Buddhist scriptures and the Buddhist text. And we can't really take refuge in something as a text. And then the Sangha is also uh, something else, someone else from us. So we say that ultimately we take refuge in our own mind, in that potential we all have within our own mind. But we need a guide. So we take refuge in the Buddha as a guide. We need a path to travel because we're not quite there yet. We haven't discovered our, then, the full potential of our own mind. So we need to travel on that path with a guide and with the teachings, which is where the Dharma, the Buddhist teachings, is our path. The Buddhist teachings is the external teachings of the text and the actual instructions, and it's also our own experience of the path. And then the Sangha, we need good guides. We need good friends on the path. And also it is the, uh, so it's our Dharma friends, but it's also the spiritual realized masters along the, along the path. So we'll look more at that when we come back from our break. I think we'll have to, we'll have to stop there for the break. Padensa vela mar in porche, da get you opened in chula, Cadren Chambergone de Sonde, Coson to Jing a drop sado. So we're back again. I hope all of our online. Uh, people are there as well and you're all okay and we will now continue with the <coughs> with the instructions in the refuge so uh, so taking refuge has three sections you could say it's you have the object of refuge who you're taking refuge in you have the duration of refuge and then you have the actual practice, actual ceremony of taking refuge. So you're not taking refuge today. Now we're just explaining it, but you, there is an actual ceremony for taking refuge. So the objects of refuge, when you go for refuge, when now if someone has decided, I want to take refuge, I want to follow the Buddhist path, then you take refuge in the three jewels. <coughs> Kunchu Sum, the three jewels. So you take refuge in the Buddha. Like I said before, ultimately we take refuge in our own mind, but we're not really capable yet of managing as we are at the moment. Our mind has not come, you know, been really purified and uh, blossomed. Like the meaning of Buddha, the word Buddha, Buddha is Sanskrit. In Tibetan, it's called Sangje. Sangje, that's what they translated from Sanskrit into Tibetan. And Sangje means, Sang means purified, and Je means increased or blossomed or expanded. <coughs> so what the meaning of Buddha, how they translated Buddha, means that all, everything that needs to be purified has been purified in terms of sang, everything has been purified. 
all our negativities, our negative habits, our anger, our jealousy, our selfishness, key thing, our ignorance, ignorance, attachment and aversion are our key obstacles. Ignorance, not knowing, not knowing who we really are and being pulled by attachment and aversion. I want this, I like this, I chase this, I run away from this. I don't want it, I don't like it, I feel threatened by it. So those three we call the root glaciers. So these have been purified, sung. Then J means all the qualities of the mind have blossomed, have come out, have really grown. That seed all of us have within the mind has uh, all the, well for all of us it hasn't bl blossomed yet, but in the Buddha, that Buddha nature, that seed that we all have, all beings have this potential of becoming a Buddha. So by purifying everything that needs to be purified, then that natural growth happens and those qualities uh, naturally arise. So that's the meaning of Buddha. But we need the Buddha, the historical Buddha, to bring us to that recognition, because we have not yet purified our ignorance, attachment and aversion, right? We can very clearly observe that we have a lot of attachment and a lot of aversion based on ignorance. So although we have that inner potential, all of us, we cannot really take refuge in our mind yet. That's why I'm saying that ultimately we're taking refuge in our own mind, but first we need a guide we need the Buddha, we need the teachings of the Buddha, we need a path, and we need companions on the path. So that's the meaning of Buddha, so this uh, Buddha, so the Buddha who has all the qualities, who has all the five wisdoms, who embodies the five wisdoms, five wisdoms that are the negative emotions transformed into wisdom. The negative emotions are transformed into all-knowing clarity, mirror-like wisdom, uh, dharma datu wisdom, sort of inner purity, no attachment and aversion. So this is equalizing wisdom, equalizing wisdom that is free from preference, no preference, no attachment, no aversion. The wisdom that arises out of that. The wisdom of discernment that doesn't, conf is not confused, doesn't give things value they don't have, does not take away value that uh, uh, is not there. So sees clearly what is there. It's not, things are not out of proportion. And then this all accomplishing wisdom, all accomplishing wisdom that works for the benefit of others. So when a Buddha is embodying these five wisdoms. All the activities of a Buddha are for the benefit of all beings. That's the only thing that is left for a Buddha to do is to, to work for the benefit of all beings. So we take refuge in the Buddha as endowed with all these qualities of compassion and wisdom. Compassion, clarity, like the nature of mind is clarity limitlessness, fearlessness. When all the negativities have been purified, these are the natural qualities of the mind, the clarity of the mind that arises when all the impurities are gone. You could say like a glass of water that's standing, a muddy water when it stands still, all the impurities sink to the bottom and that water in itself didn't really change. The water was always clear and pure but those particles have sunk to the bottom, so now we can see and observe clearly the purity of the mind, that clarity of the mind. So the inherent clarity and purity. So the Buddha, with all these qualities, we take refuge in the Buddha as this wisdom, uh, compassion and wisdom. So we could say compassion. Compassion naturally arises when there is wisdom. So one way we can think of it is the Buddha is, has awakened. You could, we call the Buddha the awakened one. 
the awakened one, meaning having awoken from this sleep of delusion is compared to being asleep, having being um, like um, yeah, awakened, awoken from the slumber of ignorance, and. Uh, you could, so, so also we talk about the relative and the ultimate. This, this state of Buddhahood is the ultimate truth. And what we are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis is the relative truth, the duality, where we are caught up in me and others and my likes and my dislikes and all this ignorance, attachment and aversion. So on a relative level, we are definitely experiencing what we are. We are definitely feeling and seeing and experiencing all these things. But on an ultimate level, a Buddha has woken up from that sleep of ignorance of being caught up in the, all this suffering of samsara, this turmoil of samsara that we have sort of talked about. The Buddha has awoken from that. And so you could say that for a Buddha, a Buddha understands what all beings are experiencing. A Buddha understands what everyone is going through on a relative level. It's like, you say, like a mother who has all these children of all sentient beings. We are all like the children of the Buddha. And if a mother is awake and sees her child or her children, having nightmares and really sort of shouting out in a dream and sweating and kicking off the duvet and having, you know, bashing around in the bed. She wants to wake the child up. She wants to say, come on, come on. You know, it's just a dream. Wake up, wake up. It's not for real. She wants to help, right? She wants to do what she can or he can, the father as well to help the child. It's sort of that idea of uh, understanding that on a relative level there is all this suffering, but it's because we are caught up in this uh, dualism, in this ignorant sleep, and this belief in our own projections. And so for the, this is what the Buddha is clearly aware of, and so for that reason there is a natural compassion uh, and um, really bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, uh, compassion uh, in all its different aspects. So for someone who has understanding, this naturally comes along with it because it it's, arises out of understanding, like the, sorry, the, the compassion arises out of understanding. So we take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge in the Dharma. The Dharma means, it's twofold, it's the Dharma of scripture and it's a Dharma of realization. So we, when we take refuge, we take refuge in all the Buddhist teachings, in terms of scripture and text and all of the 84,000 teachings. And we take refuge in the Dharma of realization, we take refuge in the path. So in terms of the scriptures, it means the Vinaya, the Sutra, the Abhidharma, but then in terms of realization, we say in terms of the training, uh, in terms of discipline, we take refuge in, in the training of discipline, we take refuge in the training of meditation, we take refuge in the training of wisdom. That's what the, the Dharma of realization means. So it's not enough to have all the texts and words on paper. They have to be applied. They become our path once we uh, engage with these three types of training, of discipline, of meditation, and of wisdom. And that is through, you know, study, studying. We're studying the path. We're contemplating the path. We're applying ourselves on the path of the, the Dharma of Scripture. So we take refuge in both of these take refuge in this realization of relative, relative and ultimate truth, both as an understanding and as, a, as an idea. So it has different levels. And, but what, what is important for us to know when we take refuge, it has this twofold aspect of, 
Yes, we take refuge in the Dharma of the Buddha's teachings, but we take refuge in what that creates for us as a path, our experience of the path. It's very individual, it has to be an experience. Then we take refuge in the Sangha. So this relates to the uh, it, uh, realized Sangha. So we cannot really take refuge in uh, our friends. We know that we can, they cannot provide us with a refuge. So we are saying we take refuge in the realized Sangha. That's why when you, when you visualize or if you have like the refuge tree that has got the realized 10th uh, level bodhisattvas on as representing the Sangha. But in some sense, there is also a recognition that on an ordinary level, we need good friends. So when you take refuge, you're saying, well, I will be careful about who's my friends because I know that I'm not strong enough not to be influenced. So I know that I need good friends. I need good Dharma friends. And I need to sort of take a, make a bit of distance from those people who are a negative influence on me because otherwise I may not be strong enough. And then, so that's the first thing, the object of refuge. Then you take refuge, it says the duration of taking refuge. Generally, you take refuge until I achieve enlightenment. In the Tibetan tradition, mostly it's like that. You say, until, so from lifetime to lifetime until I reach enlightenment. Uh, in some traditions, you take refuge for this life only. But uh, in, the, in the Tibetan tradition, generally it's from from lifetime to lifetime. It's like we're hoping, we're hoping our refuge is so strong, it will carry us on into the next life. And we will, in the next life, we will meet the three jewels. We will meet our teachers. We will meet all those we have made connection with in a positive way in this life and continue that relationship. I think that has to happen. I do believe that must happen. I do believe that the reason the reason we met the teachers, the reason we met the Kamapa, the reason we met Akka Rinpoche, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, Trungpa Rinpoche, all these great teachers, it's because we met them in the past. We made some kind of connection in the past life. So, uh, we're making that sort of, of commitment when you did, that's the part of your refuge ceremony. You're saying that, you're actually saying that. No, you're actually saying it in the, Refuge. When you take refuge, the general refuge prayer says, I take refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, meaning the Sangha, from now until I reach enlightenment. That's what you recite in the refuge prayer. And then there's the actual refuge ceremony. So the third thing is the, the actual practice of taking refuge. So there is the ceremony. Then, of course, after you take the ceremony and then uh, whenever we have sessions like this, we take refuge. Whenever you have a session yourself at the beginning, you take refuge. So once you have the formal refuge, then you, you take refuge daily. It's not that you're taking a vow that you must take refuge daily, but it's like this becomes something so central in your life and so important. But so in the refuge ceremony, so then I'll, I'll explain to you um, first, I will explain to you what you call the precepts of taking refuge. Then I'll explain the ceremony. So there are certain things that you're saying. You're saying there's three things that you will avoid and three things that you will do. So three negative things you're supposed to avoid and three positive things you're supposed to apply. Again, it's not like it's not like a precept that you break. It's not in that sense that you might break it and that there might be some terrible consequence, but it's more like this is your aspiration. This is what I want to do. I want to give up. So this is like advice in a way. It says that once I've taken refuge in the Buddha, I will not take refuge in other things that cannot provide, in other things that are that are part of the cycle of, of samsara, the things that cannot provide refuge. So, 
I guess it means you will have some recognition that things that are impermanent cannot provide you a refuge. It doesn't mean that you will not engage with life in general. Um, it just means that you will be aware. You will not worship, actually says that you will not worship those things. You will not take refuge in them if they cannot provide you a refuge. Then it says, once you have taken refuge in the Dharma, you will do your very best not to inflict harm upon other sentient beings. Because that's what the Dharma is about. The Dharma is about giving up harming, giving up negative actions. So you're saying, I will do my very, very best not to harm if I can avoid it. You're not taking a precept where you're saying not to kill. Precept is actually different. Quite often people mix up a little bit. So this is not about taking a precept not to kill. If you are a farmer, if you have a garden, sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, but you're saying, I will do my very best with my body, speech and mind to avoid harming, following the Dharma. And then the third thing says, having taken refuge in the Sangha, I will try not to associate with friends who have harmful views meaning I will try not to encourage others who have harmful views and not to be influenced by them. That means that for your own sake, it just means while you are not strong enough where you can be influenced, somebody, if somebody for example is saying, oh let's go shooting or let's go uh, hunting or let's go doing this and that, that you know is really not it goes against your wishes and your views, but you might get influenced, then, then you will rather not associate. So, but again, it doesn't mean you have to break all your relationships if somebody have those views, but it's about protecting your refuge. I think this is what the key point is here, is that you want to protect your refuge. So, and then the three things to do is that you want to, once you've taken refuge in the Buddha, you want to mm, you want to practice the words of the Buddha and not forget them and generate faith and devotion in them and that means to show respect for you're saying that you will show respect for any uh, object image, statue even if it's a broken statue, broken ripped in image you will respect it because it is an image of the Buddha so you res show respect to the form of the Buddha. So that means like, in that sense, you don't throw out. Even if a Buddha is broken, you don't throw it out. You try to, you, you put things high. You show respect the way we bow to a Buddha. It's a way of remembering your own. It's like they, something very, very the most important to you. When you've taken refuge, it's like the very, very most important to you, very high and you show respect in all these ways. It says, even so too, when you've taken refuge in the Dharma, you, tr you engage in study and reflecting and meditating the Dharma, and you, don't, you show respect for the Dharma, even if it's just a shredded piece of paper with some words of Dharma on it. You don't throw it out, you don't treat it casually. You don't put Dharma objects on the ground, for example. You don't never put a text on the ground. You put a pillow on the ground and you put your text on top of it. Because we put our feet on the floor, so feet are dirty normally. We step on dust and everything. So it's a way of, for you also to practice mindfulness by treating the three jewels with mindfulness and with care. So it's a kind of a training for oneself in being mindful and respecting the three jewels. So instead of throwing it out, you, you dispose of it in a way that is considered better. That means we burn them. You burn them, so they just become ashes, and the ashes can be washed away. So you don't just throw it in the rubbish. And then in the third way, having taken uh, refuge in the Sangha, the followers of the Buddha, you try to associate with virtuous friends and you treat them with respect and it says that you because the Sangha is represented by the ordained Sangha so you treat ordained Sangha with respect and it says even a scrap of their robes you don't uh, you don't just throw them out you again 
dispose of them refer reverently, not that you are likely to come into contact with them here very much. We don't have many Sangha in the West, but uh, you can imagine in the time of the Buddha, or if you think of India, Nepal, there are many Sangha. So because they represent the discipline of the past, being a monastic Sangha represents taking all the precepts and the vows and following the path of discipline and uh, as much as possible giving up attachment and aversion. So those are the three things to avoid, three things to adopt. And then the actual ceremony, in the actual ceremony. So there, what happens? I'm sure you want to know what happens. So, um, so what he, when you have a, a Rinpoche who gives you refuge, or a High Lama who gives you refuge, so you, don't, you only take refuge once, generally. Once you've taken refuge in a ceremony, it's not something that you really repeat. Uh, generally, once you've done it, you have done it. And what uh, happens at the end of it, you are given a refuge card with your name, you are given a Dharma name, and the time of day it is uh, recorded for yourself on your card, you write it down yourself, so, and you keep that. So you remember that as an auspicious time and date for you, and that name becomes your auspicious reminder as well. You don't have to use it. It's a Tibetan name that they, it's always very, very positive, like you might become the, uh, the guardian of the Dharma, or you might become the ocean of merit, or something like that, really wonderful name. And uh, this is something for you to aspire to, they say. These names that are given to you are what we should aspire to become, to fulfill our own potential. And so that happens at the end of the ceremony. But at the beginning of the ceremony, you sit in front of the uh, Rinpoche who gives you refuge. And um, uh, you are encouraged to imagine in space in front of you the Buddha surrounded by all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So all the great great bodhisattvas, meaning all those who, all those realized beings who have gone before, they're all there in space and witnessing you taking refuge and you take refuge in them. And then the, the refuge lama repeats, uh, asks you to repeat the refuge prayer. So like in case of Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, when he gives refuge, he will tell you, uh, say, um, he will say in Tibetan uh, and maybe in English as well, and very clearly, so it's very easy to do, it's not something you have to worry about or you might get it wrong. You're all doing it together and it's being led and it's sort of straightforward. You have to repeat after him the refuge prayer, where you're saying, I, and you do that three times, and the first two times you use your, uh, your, in your current name, English name, whatever. Then you're given the card, you come up and you get, one by one you come up and he cuts a little bit of hair from the top of your head and puts some saffron water. And that represents you are giving up old habits. At least you are entering that path of giving up old ha habits in the saffron waters like purification. And then you're given your new name and you go and you sit down. That's why you normally offer a kata, a scarf, or whatever you wish to offer at that time. And then you get that back, you go and sit down, and then a third time around, you again repeat the refuge prayer, and that time you repeat it with your refuge name. So your refuge name you should always remember, you should memorize it, because whenever there are ceremonies, Buddhist ceremonies, that's the name you will be told to use. Once you've taken refuge, that's the name you use. So you have to remember your refuge name. And you should remember the day you took refuge, and the day you, because that is a very special day for you. And um, everybody, because this is the Karma Kaju lineage, so then you're all given, in your name, you all are given the name Karma. My name is Karma Sangmo Pema. So Karma, you will be Karma, Lamo Tenzin or Kama Tsering Dolma or something like that. But everybody has Kama because we are all in the same family. She says we become Dharma brothers and sisters and you all are of the Kama family. <laughs> it 
it's like that and your karma is your is your surname <laughs> so that's how it works so then you repeat a third time around uh, this refuge prayer and then the refuge lama will say uh, now sit for a few minutes and meditate and then he will click his fingers and say when you when he snaps his fingers and you should feel you're really receiving the refuge and he's asking you also when he cuts his hair he says do I have your permission and you have to answer yes you have my permission and you have to when he snaps his fingers he says have you understood and you say yes I have understood and then you all like do three prostrations as well so that's the formal taking refuge and then you have taken refuge that's it you have sort of formally become a Buddhist and um, and then mm. after that when you when, when you take in refuge then whenever you enter a shrine room then you bow three times you prostrate three times with your own body speech and mind you put your hands to your forehead to your throat to your heart and you bow down three times the way you saw me doing and that is your saying with my own body speech and mind I pay homage I prostrate I take refuge in the Buddha in the Dharma and the Sangha I, it's like I offer my own body, speech and mind. I bow down as low as I can. I bow down with respect, with devotion, because of what you have achieved. And I inspire, I aspire to achieve the same. If it doesn't happen in this life, then in the next life, in the next life. But you have that inspiration and that respect. The more you recognize what has been achieved, the more your respect and devotion grows. And then as part of it, as part of your refuge prayer, there's also the bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta. That's not the actual refuge though, but this is the bodhisattva motivation. It says, by virtue of the goodness of my practice of generosity and the other parameters, may Buddhahood be achieved for the benefit of all, see all beings. So you have this, the two levels of bodhicitta, but this is uh, not strictly speaking part of the refuge vow. And precepts are not really, strictly speaking, part of the vow either, but every refuge lama gives the refuge. So there's slightly different, or maybe adding something here, something there. So what the way Lama Yeshe Rinpoche usually gives refuge, and also Akong Rinpoche used to do, is to give an option to take precepts for a certain length of time. So like the five precepts of, for, of a lay person, the five precepts, they are not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, uh, not to have sexual misconduct, not to take intoxicants, alcohol intoxicants. So that means not to kill, that actually means generally not to kill human beings. But it can be taken either way, it can, but in the Vinaya way it means I will not ki kill a human being. I think we're all capable of taking that vow. <laughs> I'm not going to kill a human being. <laughs> Not to lie, I will not tell the truth. Not to steal, I will not take something that doesn't belong to me. And this is intentionally, I will not intentionally kill, steal, lie, do these things. If I do it, if I happen to step on an ant or something, unintentionally I have not broken my vow. I will not have sexual misconduct, that means I will not uh, be with someone who's committed to someone else. I will not be with someone who has taken precepts of celibacy. I will, I will be faithful to my partner, that kind of commitment. That's the layperson's vow, recognizing that sexual misconduct when we are, uh, it causes a lot of jealousy, a lot of hurt, so faithfulness and trust in the relationship. And then the fifth vow is the intoxicants, alcohol and drugs, which is, uh, it's, a, it's not a root vow, it's a branch vow, but it's there because we say, yeah, the Buddha said when you, if you like drinking or alcohol, it, it muddies the water. It makes our mind unclear and it makes our decisions unclear. So once we have, if you become drunk, then easily one can, all the other vows can be broken. There's stories of that in the, in the stories around the time of the Buddha, how that became a, a vow because if someone got drunk, then they could easily also do all the other things. So, and it goes against really 
developing clarity of mind. So sometimes it's possible when, at the same time as your refuge ceremony to take those five precepts for 24 hours or for as long as you wish, for a month, for three months, for five months, for six months, for a year, whatever. And Lama Yesa says people should write it down on a piece of paper beforehand and give to him. But all of that will also be explained at that time and be made clear. Um, so, um, so if you don't take precepts, that's also absolutely fine. That is not, like I said, it's not part of the actual refuge vow. Your refuge, your refuge vow is different from the five precepts. Your refuge vow is, is taking refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, the three objects for the duration of time and in that ceremony, and where you're saying you will give up taking refuge in things that cannot provide refuge, you will give up intentionally harming others, and you will, um, you will not sort of uh, cultivate negative relationships and you will instead practice the opposite, respect for the Buddha, the form of the Buddha, respect for the Dharma, respect for the Sangha. So those are the commitments you're saying, but they are not uh, the five precepts. Then what I should say also, the ref a common question is the refuge Lama, the person who gives you the refuge vow, People say, is that my guru? Is that my teacher? And uh, in the beginning, you don't have to think of anyone as a guru. That is a much later stage. You don't need a guru at the very beginning of the path. You just need many teachers, good teachers, who can guide you along, shepherds who can guide you along the path. And maybe eventually along the path, you have a, a relationship with someone that you might think, this, is, this becomes my teacher. But uh, your refuge lama is called your refuge lama. The one who gives you refuge is called your refuge lama. So you have a, a, a special relationship with that lama because they gave you refuge. They're the first lama who introduced you to the path in that way of bringing you across that threshold. Um, and then it may often end up becoming your teacher because it may be someone who is very available and, and to you and, and accessible to you in terms of uh, where you are. But it is not like a necessity. There's no definite sort of commitment in that relationship. You don't make a commitment in that relationship. But they are your refuge lama. So I think uh, it's just Maybe this is where we, we will stop. Do you have any sort of burning questions? Because <laughs> I think when the refuge, oh yeah, what I should tell you is then, when is there an opportunity to take refuge? And at that opportunity, you will have a, a opportunity for questions for sure. So what it looks like now is that Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, before he did say, uh, last year, year before, he said he would visit all the different Samyazongs this year. It looks to me like he's not going to be able to do that. Lama Yeshe is now uh, not young anymore. Uh, and he has had all these difficulties with his back. You know, he broke his back and said, not broke it, he had like three different cracks on his spine. It was like split. And it took the doctors a long time to work out what it was. He had several falls. So at his lower spine, there was these three different cracks. So he had, but he's been on, uh, you know, for a long time he couldn't walk. Now he can walk better. They say he can walk sort of from here to there without uh, support. So I think he will not visit the Samyazongs. I don't think he will be able to travel, and, and all of us want to protect him as well. But so his message now is that he will visit, he will come to Samyaling. He's in South Africa at the moment. And he will come to Samyaling, he says, from the middle of July till the end of August. And he will give refuge during that time. But there's no definite date. But I think that's narrowing, it's like, you know, from being this wide, it's actually become this 
narrow now. You can start to narrow your time down. And you can think, well, I will go to Samuel Ling at some point when that becomes clear and I will take my refuge in Samuel Ling when those dates become available. There's still plenty of time. Uh, so he will give refuge in Sami Ling, I'm, I'm very sure about that. Uh, of course, we know that anything is possible. You may all have to go to South Africa <laughs> to <laughs> take refuge, <laughs> testing your commitment and your resolve to take refuge. But I do believe he will come back to the UK this summer. Uh, but we don't have a date yet. But I think if you can, if that helps you to plan, then that's what I would advise you to do, is keep, keep your options open. <coughs> and sign up for the Sammy Ling newsletter and the Sammy Zong London newsletter, uh, because we will definitely advertise it as soon as we hear it. Um, Sammy Ling is, is uh, uh, like us, they have been closed for two years. They are now slowly opening, but there, for them, it's even harder than for us. <coughs> they are so much bigger. Uh, you know, many of you may not have been to Sami Ling. It's a very big place, a beautiful, beautiful place. That's definitely worth visiting. Uh, a monastery, like a little village in the. Scottish uh, lower part of Scotland. And uh, to open Samiling to the public, you know, there are also not many people. And uh, like here, we are also not many people here. So depending on like our activity growing back again and their activity growing back again, it is depending on having, you know, enough uh, support to do it. So things will have to grow back in a, in a slow, natural way for it to happen. And uh, up there, what they have also is a lot of older residents who look, who need to be, like half of the residents up there need to be looked after by the other half. <laughs> People who are some of the older monks, nuns, they need looking after older residents. So it's that kind of situation. And um, with uh, Brexit happening and with the COVID happening, all these things have sort of, you know, we have to make that all come back to normal. Samuel was so busy before. I mean, there was just, it was amazing how much was going on up there. But uh, we will just have to, everybody will have to just sort of slowly, slow. And I think everyone who have been out there and under COVID, there's also a slow coming back, isn't it? There's a sort of a, tiptoeing out into the world again. Uh, from all of you who've been in lockdown at home for so long, getting out is also a big deal. But uh, I'm sure it will happen again. We will just all have to work with, with the way the situation is, but keep your eyes out for news around uh, July and August for refuge ceremony. Then you would need to book and uh, you and I'm sure there will be many. I imagine there might even be several refuge ceremonies because I think a lot of people will will uh, want to take refuge. We had about 70 people. I don't know how many are online, but there was be, between all of you and those online, there were 70 booked. So that's just Samizong London. Then you have all the other Samizong from everywhere else. Uh, so. Um, Let's just hope that it all comes together and, and we pray for that to happen. And then uh, save up your questions to then, okay? <laughs> so let's do the dedication because it's now, it's now five o'clock. Tom <laughs> 
Mace panam jeju cek, ce panam pame padang, kone kondur pelwai shoi, ke wade yen yoduta, sha cha cempo drup jone, trowa cek chamalepa, te e sala ge pa so so i hope that was helpful for all of you and for all of you online as well and uh, see you next time all the best <laughs>